Yes. Hey, y'all, we not on. We on. Hey. I don't see us on. Oh, yeah, we on. You see us on? I think we on. Hey. Are we on somebody? Oh, yeah. I see me now. We on. Hey, family. It's Theology on Thursdays. Y'all come on in. It is so funny having to do this, look at your phone and be like, okay, am I really on? And not trust the person who's sitting behind the camera telling you that you're on and all of that. So I said all that to say, y'all come on in because we're here for Theology on Thursdays. Let me know where you're coming in from. I'm going to share it because I'm about to ask y'all to share it. So let's do this. I just said I've been on eight minutes. And I know you ain't have me on eight minutes and I ain't know about it. Hey, family, y'all, come on in. Theology on Thursdays. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Do me a favor. Pastor Cheryl, I love you. Why are you not home with me? Oh, you out getting stuff for the house. Okay, that's a good reason. I love you. Come on home. Hey, listen, y'all, come on in for Theology on Thursdays. As you're coming in, do me a favor. Like and share it for me. Uh, let me know where, that you're on. Let me know where you're watching from. We are going to have an amazing time tonight. Dennis, Minister Dennis, love you, man. Good to see you tonight. Y'all come on in, like and share. Like and share. Say something in the comments. I want to greet you. I want to know that you're here. I want to speak to you. I want to say hello and all of those things. Y'all come on in. Y'all say hi. Now listen, you don't show up at church and not say hi. Do that. Terrell, hey man, good to see you tonight. Do me a favor. As you're coming in, please like and share. Please be uh, what my spiritual father calls a digital evangelist. That means that you share, you spread the word, you spread the gospel, uh, you interact. This message cannot extend as far as it could without your reach, without your partnership. So please like and share. We're going to get into this word very quickly. We're going to open up in prayer and we're going to jump in. Essence, love you. Good to see you tonight. Um, let me know that you shared. I want to know who's being obedient. Charlotte, I love you. Good to see you. I'll see you in what? Less than a month at the conference. Love you. Good to see you. Shantae, did you share? Yes. You did? Yes. The church can't hear you. Did you share? Yes, I did. All right. Shantae here helping. I, I need to make sure that she was being obedient to the look at her about to get on right now and share. Oh, she shared. All right. Y'all come on in. Y'all come on in. We're going to pray and we're going to get started. We're going to get started in about two minutes or less. So come on in. We have a great time tonight. As you know, Theology on Thursdays is our platform, is our a digital Bible study platform where we come weekly uh, to share the word of God in a very relaxed and fun setting. You know, one of the things that we always talk about is a snack. And I do have my snack tonight. My snack tonight, I got some cherries. So I have a healthy snack tonight. Y'all see my cherries? This is my snack. Now the catch with these cherries are that they don't belong to me. They belong to Pastor Cheryl. So when you see her comment in the chat and say that these belong to her, just pay attention, keep looking forward, keep looking at the pastor because it's just a spirit of distraction. But I got my snacks tonight because, you know, for Theology on Thursdays, we say we want you to bring your Bible, bring your notebook, and bring your snacks because we're going to relax, we're going to have a good time, but we're going to dig in the scriptures and we're going to take time. And we don't do it long. Most times we're on 20, 25 minutes. Um, I think right around that amount of time. Does that sound about right? No, I'm longer than that. See, now I got to help the people. Best, I love you, man. Um, but we just take time to really dig into the word. So like and share again. Let's pray and let's jump in for tonight. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you tonight for your presence. I thank you that there is no distance in the realm of the spirit. And I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation that's here. And I thank you for the grace of impartation that is here tonight as we begin to peruse through this message, as we begin to open up the scriptures and as we begin to share from the word of God, I pray that your people will be blessed, 
that they would be in, that they would receive impartation and that they would grow in the realm of knowledge and understanding of the word of God and of their calling in this hour. I thank you that the hand of the Lord is upon each person who's watching and I pray that you would grab them in their spirit and shake them and stir them up for this next season of their life. I think that we are coming into great days. Great days are not just ahead of us, but they are here right now. We love you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, listen, we have been in our series entitled Back to the Future. Pastor Shirley and I started a series a couple of months ago, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's been about two months or so, um, entitled Back to the Future. Now, Back to the Future is our series um, we, we, we have our hashtag for it, uh, prototypes, archetypes, and sent ones. And it is, it's essentially our series on the apostolic, all things apostolic. What we wanted to do was take time to make the apostolic uh, palatable, make it uh, relevant to your world, to your context. And we wanted to give a biblical worldview of the apostolic ministry from the Bible and how it pertains to you, your life, your ministry, and your calling. One of some of the things that we established in our time together is that the new church was founded upon number one, the apostles and prophets, but it was this apostolic grace. It was this apostolic anointing that birthed the church. We talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit in essence is apostolic because he was sent to the earth realm. And then we begin to unpack how the book of Acts really is a chronicling and it is a story of the acts of the Holy Spirit through his apostles and apostolic people. And the reason we highlighted that dynamic of apostolic people is because we wanted you to understand that this realm of anointing and this grace is not just relegated or assigned to a fivefold officer. There is fivefold grace. There are fivefold graces. We acknowledge that. We uh, we flow in those realms and the like. But our conversation is tailor made today and in this series to the everyday believer who's called to walk in realms of God's power, called to walk in realms of God's anointing, called to walk in realms of God's essence, if you will. We are an apostolic people. I want you to type that in the conversation. Type that tonight in our chats, in our conversation, that we are an apostolic people, or you can even make it personal tonight. I am an apostolic believer. I am an apostolic believer. And with that understanding, with that revelation, what becomes important is to understand how to move in this grace, how to move in this calling, how to move in this anointing, and how to be the best um, in your realm of influence that God has called you to. So let's jump into this tonight. Uh, we, again, our, the name of our series is Back to the Future. Specifically, we're talking tonight, we're going to teach on the Tabernacle of David. Tonight, we're going to teach on the Tabernacle of David, the Tabernacle of David. And as we're talking about the Tabernacle of David, what we're aiming to do is show you more revelation and insight concerning the apostolic through the realm, through the lens of the Tabernacle of David. Now, we understand that there were two main tabernacles in the scriptures. In the scriptures, there were two main, there were other tabernacles, but tonight we're going to look at the two main tabernacles and we're going to see how it ties in. So I hope you brought your Bible. We are going to do a little work in the scriptures tonight. Number one, we know the first tabernacle that we see in scriptures is the tabernacle of Moses. We know that somebody write that in the chat who's paying attention, the tabernacle of Moses. Now let me read this scripture to you. I want you to write it down if you're taking notes. Exodus chapter 25, verse Verse 1 through 8. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1 through 8, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. For everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you will take my offering. And this is the offering that you should take from them gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair, a whole bunch of stuff. But if we go all the way down to verse 8, here's what we want to focus on. God says to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary. Or here's another word. Let them make me a tabernacle that I may dwell among them. Let them make me a tabernacle that I may dwell among them. So we, we see here this first tabernacle that God institutes 
is this tabernacle of Moses. And he said, then make me a tabernacle. Here's the purpose that I may dwell among them. But let's look at that word dwell. The word dwell there means to have habitation. It means lodging. It means to establish. It means to fix. I love this one. It means to lay a deposit. To lay a deposit. And so Jesus, God is saying in this text, let them make me a tabernacle that I may lay a deposit among them. I think that's wonderful. But all of these words, when you talk about habitation, lodging, establish, fix, lay a deposit, the great, the beauty of this is it's not just talking about uh, intimacy. We know it's talking about intimacy and worship, but beyond that, God is establishing here ownership. Somebody write that in the chat, ownership. So when we look at the tabernacle of Moses, we're not just looking at a place of intimacy. We're looking at a place of ownership. God is coming, not just for worship, not just so we can have intimacy, but God is coming that he may take ownership of a people. And I think that's important to put there because when we talk about worship, I want you to understand worship is not just about who you sing to, Worship is about who owns you. That's, that's worth putting in the chat. Worship is not just about who you sing to. Worship is about who owns you. And so when God says here, let, me make, let them make a sanctuary or a tabernacle, he's saying that I may show and have ownership over them. Now, we understand from a theological perspective, I want you to understand this, that Israel was God's chosen people in the Old Testament. Israel was God's chosen people. Here's what God did. He used Israel as a model for how he would interact and engage with the world at large. I want you to understand that. So from a theological perspective, Israel was God's chosen people, and he used Israel as a model for how he would interact and engage with the entire world. I want you to picture this now because... God says, I want you to make me a tabernacle among Israel, among my people. Now, all of the other neighboring nations, they all were polytheistic. I want you to picture this here. You need to get a good picture of what's happening here. So all of the nations, oh, neighboring nations, they were polytheistic. What does that mean? They served many gods. So while all of these nations are serving multiple gods, multiple deities, God comes in the midst of all that and he says, make me a tabernacle among my people that I and only I may have ownership. I want you to see what God is doing there. Make me a tabernacle that I and only I may have ownership of my people. God uses, hear this, the tabernacle to establish his preeminence. I'm teaching you about the tabernacle tonight. God uses the tabernacle to establish his preeminence. The tabernacle was the place where God would dwell, have ownership, and lead his people from. So God led his people through the technology, through the vehicle of the tabernacle. So the tabernacle not only represents worship, but the tabernacle represents government. Somebody put that in the chat. The tabernacle represents government. The tabernacle represents government. The tabernacle represents government. It's a part of how God establishes his rule among the people. The tabernacle represents government. So we have this tabernacle of Moses, and I'm going to get into the, all the history tonight because uh, we don't have time for it. But what begins to happen is the main article in the tabernacle was always the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of the Lord. We know that. What begins to happen over time, Moses dies, Israel goes on, they lose a regard for the presence, and God comes to recover his ownership, and the Ark... The presence of God changes locations. I'm building a case and I'm going to do it quickly. We'll get to where you want to be. The ark changes locations. The ark changes locations. So David now and Samuel, when David assumes kingship, David gets a word from God to move the ark of the covenant to a new location. 
That's important as a life principle. He tells him to move the presence to a new location because while God does not change, we need to understand that about him, his, pre, his character, he does not change, but he will switch locations. And it is important to know and to discern where God is from where he isn't. His character will always be the same, but he does switch locations. He does highlight different parts of his character at certain moments and at certain times. So the art changes locations. What that means is for us, whatever we do, our life must be built around the ark. Whatever I do in my life, come on now, we teach him. The, my life must be built around the ark. So in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 17, somebody put that scripture in the chat. That's our next scripture. It says, so they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle of David. He erected it there, and then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the ark switches locations, and now David has built the next tabernacle. So we have the tabernacle of Moses, and now we have here the tabernacle of David. And there were some distinct, there were some differences and distinctions between these two tabernacles. So Moses' tabernacle, as we know, it had an outer court, an inner court, and the Holy of Holies. These three parts. And the, inner, the, the Holy of Holies was reserved for the priest. Now, when we look at this tabernacle of David, it didn't have all of those pieces. It had a tent, and it mainly just had the Ark of the Covenant. So it wasn't about the look and the grandeur. There was this focus on the presence, okay? So here, we're talking about back to the future. Moses built a tabernacle, and I'm going to prove this to you. Moses built a tabernacle, and his day was, and it was what was needed in the now. It was what was needed in the now of his day. I want you to get that. David comes and builds a tabernacle patterned after what would be needed in the future. And I'm going to show you that. We're talking about back to the future. Moses builds a tabernacle based on what was needed in the now. David comes and builds a tabernacle patterned after what would be needed in the future. We're talking about back to the future. So after David's tabernacle is uh, torn down after it is destroyed. We know what happens historically. Amos, Amos comes and prophesies in Amos chapter 9, verse 11. I want you to write that scripture down. He says, on that day, I will raise up again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. So I want you to hear this. There were multiple tabernacles, but God promises only to raise up again one tabernacle, and it's the tabernacle of David. He could have chosen to raise up the tabernacle of Moses again, but he doesn't. He chooses to raise again the tabernacle of David. Why? Because Moses built what was needed in the now. David comes and builds what's needed in the future. How do we see that? Amos proph prophesies that God would rebuild the tabernacle of David. In Acts chapter 15, we see this begin to happen from a spiritual standpoint. That's our next scripture. I hope I'm not moving too fast for you. Acts chapter 15, verse 16, it declares again what Amos would say, that after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. So what's happening in Acts chapter 15? The Jerusalem council is meeting and they're having a conversation around who should be circumcised, who shouldn't. There is this argument around can Gentiles accept the faith? Can they be uh, bought and purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ and be accepted into the beloved? And in the middle of that conversation, we hear this statement, and I'll again rebuild the tabernacle of David. Why? Because the pattern of the tabernacle of David is when God goes global. In the tabernacle of David, we hear and we see now that God goes global and he's making this statement in the middle of this argument with Jews and Gentiles that his presence is for all. So in Moses' tabernacle, everybody couldn't get into the deep places. They couldn't get into the Holy of Holies. David builds before time what was needed at a model at a later time. So David builds what the future would need before the future ever manifest. We're talking about back to the future. David builds what the future would need before the future would ever manifest. So David really is, uh, if you will, he is this premier Old Testament type of apostolic leader. We're looking at this, this dimension and this dynamic of the apostolic 
through this tabernacle of David. He really is an Old Testament type of apostolic leader. We see him, how he builds this tabernacle. We see this pioneering grace. He built something in a way that it's never been built before. So he pioneers a new model. He pioneers a new pattern. He's the first of his kind. But not only do we see him as a pioneer, we also see him as a prototype. Why? How do we see him as a prototype? Because as time progresses, we end up modeling the tabernacle of David in our now, because we're going back to the future. So in Acts chapter 15, God raises this revelation of this tabernacle in the midst of the apostolic community that's being built. So this apostolic community is being built. The, the, the gospel message is spreading to the four corners of the world, and God resurrects this revelation and this prophetic word that God is going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. So when we look at this tabernacle of David, when we stare at it, when we and this is how, for my Bible students, for my ministers who are watching, how you gain revelation is by your ability to look at a thing and to stare at a thing. You take a text, you look at it, you stare at it. You take a concept, you look at it, and you stare at it. So when we look at this concept, when we look at this idea of this tabernacle of David, and we stare at it, and we get revelation from it, we find that there are some necessary accoutrements for seeing this tabernacle of David established in our time. Here's the principle that I want you to understand. Every age, every generation, and every territory needs an ark. That's representative of the presence of the Lord. Every age, every generation, every territory, every family line needs an ark. And so our assignment then from a spiritual context is to establish and have an understanding of how this tabernacle of David is resurrected in our time, in our life, and in our understanding. So we have uh, four revelations that we're going to give you about the tabernacle of David. We're going to give them to you really quickly. On our time will be wrapped up. I hope you're enjoying it so far. I tell, somebody tell me, are y'all getting this? Are y'all getting this information? Somebody tell me in the chat. I don't just want to rush through it. I want you all to catch what we're saying. Somebody let me know. How we doing? And then we'll jump into these four things and we'll get out of here. Nobody getting it? Okay. I need to start over from the... Shante, I need to start over from the top. No. Are you getting it, Shantae? The church can't hear you. Yeah. All right. Shantae says she's getting it. Shantae getting it. There, everybody getting it. All right. So we have these four. Apriya, hey, love you. Good to see you tonight. So we have these four principles or accoutrements that we're going to pull from the tabernacle of David to show how we did it. Thanks, man. How we established the tabernacle of David pattern within our generation. Every age, every generation. Every territory needs an ark. All right? Mama Witherspoon, love you. Good to see you tonight. So number one, this tabernacle of David shows us this revelation or this principle of sovereignty. The revelation of sovereignty. The revelation of sovereignty. S-O-V-E-R-E-I-G-N-T-Y. Sovereignty. What is this? What is what does sovereign mean? If God is sovereign, that means he's in full control. Uh, nations have sovereign. So if you look at how England is set up, they don't have a, a president. They have a sovereign over that nation that determines everything. Okay? So we have this revelation of sovereignty that we see with the tabernacle of David because we understand, I told you, it's about government. So that means when we have a tabernacle established in a time, it's talking about the reality that God governs and controls all. That we're talking about now our lives, our lives, our life space, our family, whatever happens in my life, my career is in his sovereign hand. My relationships are in his sovereign hand. My ministry is in his sovereign hand. We see this revelation of sovereignty. Hear this. If we are going to do Christianity God's way, it starts with the acknowledgement that God is sovereign. That's a Selah moment. If we are going to do Christianity God's way, 
It starts with the acknowledgement that God is sovereign. And that's important for us to understand is because we built a Christianity that doesn't look like Bible Christianity. We've built a Christianity that is about us. It's about our ministry. It's about our gifting. It's about, it's, it's, it's a self-centered gospel. But the message of the cross is about Christ and him crucified. And so then Jesus comes and says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to pick up your cross and follow me. It's a place of death. And, and we've taught Christianity. We've pumped Christianity from a place of me, me, me. I'm going to be the best. And you may do that. That's, that's wonderful. We believe in destiny. However, at the end of the day, this is all about God. I was having this conversation with one of my spiritual daughters yesterday. And I said, so if I understand that this is all about God, I am only alive to fulfill God's will. I am not alive because I, I need to have uh, fun. I'm not alive just to travel. I'm not alive to make just to make friends. Those are all byproducts. I'm alive and I'm in this earth to fulfill his will, which means if I ever want to step apart from that, I don't have a reason to be alive because that's, that's the only reason I'm alive. To, and so I've got to teach you Christianity God's way. At the end of the day, this really is all about, which means I can't be mad when he requires certain things of me that goes against my flesh. Why? Because it's all about him. I can't be mad when he tells me to go left when I want to go right because it's all about him. Because when we teach Christianity God's way, it starts with the acknowledgement that it's all about him. So I learned to crucify my flesh because I understand it's all about him. I told one of my daughters yesterday, I said, there are things that all of us, we want to do in our flesh, but I want the realms of his presence even more. I want the realms. And so when we, if we're going to do Christianity God's way, it starts with the acknowledgement that God is sovereign and that he rules and that he controls all. That is a part of the accoutrements and the message of this tabernacle of David. He establishes his ark in a place, not just so they can sing great songs to him, but that they can understand that he is sovereign and he owns them. It's about his government. So number one, when we look at this tabernacle of David, we see this revelation of sovereignty. Number two, we see this revelation of the prophetic. Come on, Apriya, say that again. I want the realms. I want the realms more than I want my flesh to be satisfied. I want the realms more than I want my career. I want the realms more than I want a platform. I want the realms. Number one, the revelation of sovereignty. Number two, we see in this tabernacle of David, the revelation of the prophetic. A revelation of the prophetic. How do we see that? Around the tabernacle of David, David established psalmists, minstrels, and prophets that would prophesy the word of the Lord, that would sing the word of the Lord, that would play the word of the Lord. And when they did this, what, be, what begins to happen is the prophetic words begin to determine the direction of the nation and begin to give revelation and insight into who God is. So they were governed by the voice of the prophetic. So when we understand his sovereignty, we understand that they were led by the voice of God. And so when we talk about the tabernacle of David being resurrected in our day, in every age, in every generation, in every territory, we're going to have to begin to understand the prophetic ministry because every age needs the voice of God. Every person needs the voice of God. Every territory needs the voice of God. This is why there is such a stirring for prophets and prophetic people in this hour, because God is about to make an announcement concerning the direction of an entire generation, the direction of the nation, the direction of the age. There are those who can feel that there is something rising in their spirit. There are prophetic burdens. There are prophetic leadings. There are dreams. Excuse me, and all of this comes in the realm of the prophetic. Why? Because in this hour, God is raising prophetic voices in the midst of this revelation of the tabernacle of David because we need his voice to understand the direction that we're going. 
Where is the body of Christ going in this hour? What should be the focus of the body of Christ, the church at large, this nation, the nations, when everything is topsy-turvy and, and the world is in transition? That's one of the greatest times when God will raise a prophetic voice when the world is in a space of transition, when the tectonic plates of, are shifting, when governments are shifting, when, po when political uh, landscapes are changing, God begins to raise this prophetic voice and this prophetic edge. And I want you to understand, as we're ministering tonight, I believe that one of the things that God is doing is that he's raising the prophetic water levels even on the inside of you, that he's raising your prophetic depth, that he's raising your prophetic density, and he's giving you greater understanding of what it means to minister for him in a prophetic context. Your generation needs the voice of God. Your industry needs the voice of God. Your family needs the voice of God. Your children need the voice of God. And it comes through this do this technology of the prophetic. So number one, we begin to understand the revelation of his sovereignty, but then we also begin to understand the revelation of the prophetic. Elder Deb, I love you. We also begin to understand the revelation of the prophetic. Here's the next one. We have two more. We're getting out of here. And we see this, if we're going to raise this awareness, we're talking about back to the future, and we're looking at the apostolic through the lens of the tabernacle of David. So as I'm giving you these principles, I want you to carry them in your spirit. This revelation of sovereignty, this revelation of the prophetic. Number three, the revelation of conquest. Somebody put that in the chat. The revelation of conquest. The revelation of conquest. To have an understanding of the apostolic, let me say it this way. The apostolic ministry is an awareness that Jesus is not only a meek and lowly lamb, he's also a conquering king. That's another say la moment. All right? The revelation of conquest, a conquest. What is a conquest? It is a voyage. To have an understanding of the apostolic is to understand that Jesus is not only a meek and lowly lamb, he's also a conquering king. He is a king with a conquest. When you look at the Old Testament, we saw, we, when we look at the Old Testament, there were always these battles and these wars that were happening. Israel against Canaan. Uh, Israel against Ai, like there, there was, there were always these battles that were happening. These battles that happened in the Old Testament was not were not just because people didn't get along. There was this spiritual backdrop to every war that we saw in the Old Testament, and it's still the same way today. Every war was about two things: gods and nations. I want y'all to hear me. I pray you are getting this. I want to increase your paradigm tonight. Wars are about gods and nations because the God who owns the land, the, the, the person who owns the land, their God also owns the land. So even in our nation, whatever God controls President Biden is the God who has the main voice in the nation. That's why it's so important for the church to rise up and be a buffer and to superimpose its voice against every system because it's about conquest. So the tabernacle of David, what would happen every time the ark would move to a different location, it was an apostolic statement that God was taking that territory because the tabernacle of David, it deals with conquest. Whenever, before they would go to battle, they would, they would, they would spend time at the ark in prayer and worship. Um, and they would also move the ark based upon the conquest and where God was going next, how he was shifting locations, right? And so you have to understand conquest. And you've got to understand that a part of your assignment in the earth as an apostolic people is to the ministry of conquest. Everywhere you go is an opportunity to go on a voyage to take territory, to take a people, to take a mindset, to take it back for the kingdom of God. Because Jesus was not just a meek and lowly lamb. He was and is a conquering king. 
And Jesus' idea, I told you, the tabernacle is about God going global. It's about him moving from one space to populate a territory, to populate a nation. Pastor Cheryl here, y'all. Hey, Pastor. The, it's about taking territory, and it's about a conquest. And so God is raising you up in this hour to understand sovereignty, his sovereignty, allowing him to lead your life and spreading that message. He's raising you up to understand and move in his voice, but he's also raising you up to be one of conquest. He's raising you up to be one of conquest. Here's the last one. So we have the revelation of sovereignty, a revelation of the prophetic, the revelation of conquest. Here's the last one, a revelation of culture. A revelation of culture. They established a culture around the ark. Can, let me say it better than that. They allowed the ark to establish the culture. They allowed the ark to establish the culture. So around this tabernacle, they had a tone. It was loud. It was jubilant. They had a belief system. They had a way of doing things. Here's, the, here's why. Because after you go on a conquest, you establish God's kingdom culture. I'm teaching you the apostolic way. After you go on a conquest, you establish God's kingdom culture. What does that look like? So uh, apostles, apostolic people, from, from a historical standpoint, they would go on these military voyages, conquests. And when they would go, they would go with the full backing of the king, and they would either retrieve and take uh, people, the resources, back to where they came, or they would uh, set up shop and establish their dominion in that territory, in that providence, and they would teach them the culture from where they came. That is the apostolic way. God has called you. He has anointed you. And he's increasing the anointing on your life to be one who impacts and shifts culture. Culture has a voice. Culture has a God. Culture is a stronghold. And culture determines how people think what they say, what they do, and how they behave. It's our assignment to disrupt worldly culture with the message of the kingdom. You can't do that if you're married to the world. You can't do that if you're more in love with the world's culture than you are the culture of the kingdom of God. It becomes necessary for us in our lives to understand the way God thinks the way he behaves, to adopt that in our own selves. What is the culture of the kingdom? God first, servants, leadership, dominion, the supernatural, the anointing, all principles that you know. It's our job to shift culture with the culture of the kingdom, to disrupt and interrupt the pattern, the culture of the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of darkness with the culture of the kingdom. It is our assignment, prophetically speaking, spiritually speaking, to resurrect this anointing and this revelation of this tabernacle of David in our power. And we see through the scriptures in Acts chapter 15 that this anointing and this revelation is resurrected in the apostolic community, which tells us that it's a part of our job and our assignment to adopt and understand this tabernacle of David because it becomes the pattern for God going global, where we understand his sovereignty, his voice, our assignment to go on conquests for his name's sake, and how to shift culture. We talked tonight about Back to the Future, and we looked through this, through the apostolic, which we've been teaching you on, from the lens of this tabernacle of David. Let me pray for you. I pray you a blessing. And Father, I thank you tonight for these, your people. I thank you that these your people are being raised in apostolic awareness and apostolic consciousness. And I pray that tonight, based off of what we taught tonight, that you help your people understand the revelation of your sovereignty. You help tonight your people understand the revelation of the prophetic. You help your people tonight understand this revelation of the conquest, that you are Jesus, the conquering king. You are a conqueror. And not only that, but we're, excuse me, called to shift culture. 
raise that awareness in our lives and cause us to walk into the fullness of this apostolic dimension in our lives day in and day out. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I love you all and I thank you all so much for hanging out with us on Theology on Thursdays. Listen, you can show via, um, they'll put it up because I don't know the way that you sew. I think you sew through uh, maybe Cash App, uh, Dollar Sign, the Destiny Center, RBA, PayPal. It's our uh, uh, email office at the Destiny Center, RBA. Um, Givelify, the Destiny Center, RBA. But listen, when you know when you go to church, you're supposed to sew, whether that's digital or that's in person. So tonight we pray that you would sew into the word tonight. Uh, we are still in the middle of our destiny campaign. As you all know, we have acquired our building, bless the Lamb of God, and we're still doing some things there. As you saw, you saw that uh, Pastor Cheryl and I announced that we are launching a um, an early learning center and daycare, and we'll be giving you more information about that. We're going to update you on where we are in our destiny campaign. Uh, Minister Shantae keeps reminding me about that, and so we're going to do that. Uh, but I pray that you all were blessed tonight. We love you all. Do me a favor. Share this with somebody who needs this. We are called to be apostolic people and apostolic believers. Send it to somebody's inbox. Share it again. Tag a couple of people. Tag about five people. I need everybody in here to tag five people to watch this tonight. We love you. We bless you in Jesus' name tonight. We'll see you soon. Peace.